happy to have each and every one of you here today. This is Spiritual Warfare, and we're going to start Lesson 11, Part 1. Uh, we don't have much left. I was shocked when I really realized it. So, and I think all of you know, we're planning with the Lord's help. I really felt um, when this finishes, we will be going into the book of Song of Solomon. All right. So you can tell your friends and those that would like to understand that book. It's a very misunderstood book. And um, the things that I've written, I, I wrote a manual on it. I didn't get it out of anything else. I got it by just waiting upon the Lord and how the Lord revealed to me what the different things were. All right. So be sure and join us whenever this course ends. For a review, if you remember, we've been uh, dealing in spiritual warfare on Revelation 12, um, verse 11, which says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And uh, last week we finished, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So to summarize this truth, it means to love God more than we love ourselves, to choose to please God rather than please ourselves, and to have no reservations in obeying God. All right. Uh, today's lesson, all right, following Christ involves suffering, all right, willing to suffer for Christ. Because sometimes to do the will of God is definitely going to involve suffering. And we need to understand that. Um, so let's start with the beginning, counting the cost, all right? The teaching of Jesus is that there is a cost in following him, all right? And, and I'm going to ask you to write down two portions of scripture. The first is Luke 14, 27 to 30. And under uh, B, Luke 14, 31 to 33. All right. Um, the teaching of Jesus is there is a cost in following him. And so we really need to consider this. And we need to count the cost. Jesus tells us that, to count the cost. I, I still remember one of our first converts that we had when we uh, started Bethel Assembly of God. It was a young man, a teenage boy. And we were just thrilled when he uh, accepted the Lord. But you know, we hadn't gone very far, he hadn't in his Christian walk, when he faced persecution. And the suffering started, and he came to us and he said, I didn't realize it was going to involve this. He said, no, 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 I, I, I don't want. And he turned his back. Whether he's ever come back to the Lord over the years, may God have mercy on him. But uh, when he found out there was suffering entailed, persecution entailed, and it's going to come to every child of God, somewhere along the line, you're going to face it. Now, we're going to look at Luke 14, 27 to 30. Yes. Um, Luke 14, 27 to 30. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. 
All right, now there's only one foundation, we know that. And that foundation is accepting Christ. If you try to build a Christian life on anything but Jesus, it's not gonna work. He is the basic foundation. Once you receive him, then you start building on that foundation to build a life for God, all right? And Jesus says here in verse 27, if you do not bear your cross, we know taking up a cross means death to self. That's what it meant for Jesus. He had to take his cross. He was nailed to the cross. It wasn't for himself. It was for you and for me. But he says, unless you are willing to take your cross, so that means each and every one of us, there's going to be things that come in our life that will say death to self, where we have to deny the self, where we have to say no to the self uh, in order to say yes to the Lord. And he said, unless you're willing to do that and follow me the way that I did, you cannot be my disciple. You might claim to be a believer. And uh, some people that claim to believers uh, they allow, I don't know what all, I'm not the judge, so I, I can't really judge them. But let me tell you, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus and really follow him, then you're going to have to realize and come to grips that we're going to have to uh, suffer, all right? Now, this first one that we read, all right? if you can write it somewhere there, this is in the light of the present, all right, as right here on earth, while we're here on earth. If we start to build a tower, we're going to consider, do we really have enough money, all right? Uh, do we have enough to finish it? Otherwise, once we lay the foundation and then we're not able to finish it, uh, people will laugh. There, there's more than just accepting Christ. We, we need to understand that that's just the beginning step. Of course, there can be no nothing further till we do that. That's the main step to accept Christ. But then to build a life for him uh, that will be pleasing to him, that will make an impact here on this life. We have to understand this carefully. It's going to cost us everything, all right? We need to count the cost. Now, we're going to look at it in the light of eternity, all right? In the light of the present day, there's no point in taking the first step. But really, it's after you take that first step, you need to stop and think. Are you able to finish it? You know, we, we just need to understand that. All right. But what about in the light of eternity? It's the same chapter, Luke 14, 31 to 33. Yes. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. All right. It's more than just can we finish it here? We need to think of eternity. When, we gonna, when we're going to face God himself, all right, um, and really unsaved people need to be faced with this. When you face God, what are you going to say to him? And he uses this example of a king and an army. They have an army of 10,000 or an army of 20,000. Well, I'll tell you, when we face 
God as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the creator of heaven and earth, uh, what we have will be absolutely nothing in comparison to him. There's no way that we're going to be able to defeat God and say, look, I don't want to go your way and I'm going to keep going my way. But we're, we're going to find out that in the end, when we face eternity, if you don't yield to God, when you face God, you're, you're finished. You're not only finished for eternity, you're going to a hell that burns with fire forever and ever. All right. So we need to count the cost, whether it's in this life or whether it's in the life hereafter, there is a cost. And as B says, the cost is total commitment. Let's read Matthew 13, 44. Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath forth, he hideth, had found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and sell, selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. All right. So it claims when a man is found, all right, um, don't get the idea that we pay for our salvation. Salvation is full and free. But after you accept Christ, you're going to find, yes, there is this high cost to maintain because it's not the person that starts well, it's the person that ends well. And you're going to find that this world, if you're one that cares what people think, you're going to find out that this world is against Jesus because um the devil is the prince of this world, and he's the enemy of God. He rebelled at, out of selfish motivation. He began, even though God created him, made him the highest of creation, and made him so beautiful and gave him every kind of um, ability and, uh, yeah. And instead of being grateful and thankful, he became proud and arrogant and wanted to be as God, not only he wanted to be God. He didn't want to be second to God. He wanted to be God. And that's what caused his downfall. It was pride, all right? Pride and arrogance. And he's still using the same. Remember, I've told you several times that the word pride the I is the middle letter, all right, the big I. And he uses that in each and every one of us, the devil, all right, to try to turn our back on the Lord. When you first accept the Lord, usually a person does it out of uh, sheer desperation. Something happens and uh, they're introduced to the Lord and, you know, and they receive him into their life, but it's not just that simple. Once you receive him, you start finding out that there's a lot of difficulties in the way when the Lord starts helping us to turn away from self. Remember, when he paid the full price for us, we he found us like a diamond in the rough. When we come to him, yes, we're precious to him. I'm not saying we're not precious to him, but we are encased with all kind of habits and things that just aren't in keeping. And, you know, when you've been all your life habitually doing certain things, behaving in a certain way, yes, he changes the internal. He gives you a new spirit, but you have to yield to that new spirit and allow it to work in you. And it's gonna start chipping away some of this stuff that is not fitting for a child of God. The flesh life, the self life, all right, has to be cut away 
so that Jesus can really shine out of us. And th this is where the taking up of the cross, sometimes it's other people uh, doing it to us, all right? So it mentions here again, all right, the kingdom of heaven. Remember when we're here on this earth, this is the kingdom of the world. This is the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of light. The kingdom of this world, which is uh, a kingdom of darkness, is run by the prince of darkness, all right? It's the devil who is in charge of it. And he hates the things of God, and he hates light, and he's going to do everything he can to get his people that are still under him to come against you and so forth, that this is, it isn't that God is wanting to do that. God allows it. Yes, he, he allows it. But um, it, it's really Satan behind this thing. So the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure that's hid. The, uh, that treasure is Jesus, our Savior, all right? And it, it's a man has found it. You don't buy it. Uh, you find it. But once you found it, he said, I want this to be mine forever. I don't want to ever lose Jesus. And therefore, he's willing to sell all that he has. You're not buying salvation. You're getting rid of anything that would hinder you from continuing your walk with the Lord, all right? Because we're told very clearly in Corinthians that when you come to the Lord, you're bought with a price. You are not your own. And henceforth, we are to live to him and no longer to live to self. So once we discover that, it begins a war on the self so that we can continually keep pleasing the Lord now that we belong to him. We do not belong to ourselves. All right, let's uh, go down here to number two. Sold all that he had, 44 to 46. Same chapter. Okay. Again. 45 and 46. 45 yeah. and 46, okay. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Yeah. So I, now it, it, the other is you found a treasure. And definitely Jesus is a treasure, all right? And you're, you're willing to sell all in order to make him yours and keep him as yours so that down the line, you don't lose him. Of course, people who believe in eternal security, they, they believe no matter what you do. No, no, no. I tell you, God the Father says, no one can pluck you out of my hand. That's true. No one can take you away from the Lord. But neither is God going to do like the devil and say, you're mine. And I don't care if you want to jump out. You can't. You came, no, you have every right any time in your life to jump out of his hand and go back to living for self, all right? And sometimes you don't do it purposely. Sometimes you don't do it knowingly like myself. And I was already a missionary by the time God really began dealing with me because there was this area of my life that when I didn't get what I wanted, I reacted very badly. And in the flesh, I began to like run away. And one day he just talked to me straight. Where are you going? I said, I don't know where I'm going. He said, I mean, are you going to heaven or to hell? Well, of course I'm going to heaven. Who would be stupid enough to choose to go to hell? Of course, I'm going to heaven. He said, well, you're on the, you're going the wrong direction. He said, turn around. You get back to your husband 
and don't you dare do this again. That was to be angry and then run away uh, and show my anger and run away. All right, not knowing where I was going. He said, this kind of, you think you're going to heaven, but taking this kind of a pathway, living this kind of a life, you're on the road to hell. And remember what the Bible says, friends. It says there is a way that seemeth right. And that way that seems right is I can accept the Lord and I can keep on living the way I lived before I came to him. I can keep pleasing myself. I can keep doing my own thing, even though I have Jesus. Now Jesus will take me to heaven, but I can keep, no, no, no. There's a way that seems right, but the end of that way is the way of hell. It's the way of destruction. And I tell you, when the Lord showed me that, it scared the living daylights out of me. And I, I went back and I apologized. And I began saying, God, help me to recognize the self-life. I don't belong to myself, but if I'm determined to keep following the self-life, it's going to lead me to perdition. The self the flesh, the old nature was nailed to the cross. It is counted as sin. I don't know how I'm getting into this, but somebody today needs what I'm telling you. Friends, we've got to understand, once we accept Christ, we've got to see our old nature is what put Jesus on that cross. And therefore, we must now accept this new nature that will be like him and follow in his footstep and in our daily walk keep saying to the flesh no 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 I am not going to yield to you when we're tempted of the devil so this one in Matthew 13 45 to 46 is not just a treasure but this is a merchant all right who deals in pearls pearls are so beautiful all right and he finds one pearl of great price, all right, of great price. And after finding it, it tells us that he sold all in order to buy that pearl. He wanted to make sure that pearl belonged to him. And if we want to make sure that we have Jesus at the end of our life, then we've got to be willing to sell all because the old nature will hinder you from ultimately at the end. Uh, I don't know why I'm thinking of this story, but it, it seemingly has nothing to do with it, but it does. Uh, and that is about that lady that was the mother of an evangelist. And she was very very spiritual, quote, unquote, in her church. She was known. She never missed services. She held high positions. She was definitely had been born again and had been baptized in the spirit. I want you to listen to this carefully. All right. This evangelist told the story all right, to another evangelist. And that evangelist came to our church and told the story. That's how I heard it. This evangelist said that Jesus took him on a journey to heaven and then to hell. And when they went down to visit hell, as they got closer, he could hear the screams of people in that terrible fire, all right? And when they got to the edge of Jesus and this evangelist, he, he could look inside the flames of hell and he actually saw people there that he knew. He was shocked, but suddenly he saw one person and it was his mother-in-law, this lady that I told you about. And he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, how could you send her down to hell? She was so spiritual. She never missed a service. Everybody looked up to her. 
And he said, the eyes of Jesus became so sad. And he said, when she was young, her, one of her brothers did something to her that she could never forgive. She felt she could never forgive. He said, from the time she was young, I have been speaking to her to forgive and let him go for what he did, but she would not forgive. As she grew up, she just harbored this unforgiveness against her brother. He didn't say what the brother did. I have no idea what he did, but she wouldn't let go. She went on, all right, she kept seeking the Lord, all right, supposedly, but she wouldn't let go. But the Bible says, if you don't forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive you. And when it came time for her to die, she had not yet been willing to forgive. And Jesus said, I never sent her there. She sent herself. And friend, I want you to know, don't think you can get away with murder just because you accepted Jesus. No, to keep Jesus, we've got to prize him. We have to understand he is a pearl of great price. There's no one else that can get us to heaven. He is the most precious thing in the whole world. And if it takes saying no to self till there's nothing left of self, that's it's worth it to sell all. And I am going to have you put another verse here in order to buy the pearl, the merchant sold all. Right there, put Philippians chapter three, seven and eight. This is talking about Paul. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ yeah. and be found in him. Amen. Um, yeah, just, did I say nine? No, seven and eight. All right, that I may win him. Not that I may get salvation. Salvation, we accept Christ, all right? But there's more than that. There's to know him, to become like him, to start growing in him. This is where it's gonna cost us everything. And Paul himself says, I count all things but loss, all right? for the excellency, and I have suffered the loss of all things. It cost me everything, but he said it was worth it to me because I want to win Christ because once we accept Christ, now it's like running a race, and he is the prize at the end of the race. It has nothing to do with good works. Don't get me wrong. Don't misinterpret me to anybody. I don't believe in that but it's like running a race and he is the prize, all right? Yes, I know you couldn't even run the race if you never accepted Christ, all right? You couldn't start on that race. Jesus paid it all. But now that you've accepted him, that old nature needs to be, your back needs to be turned on it completely and you have to keep your eyes on the goal, on the prize, amen. All right, C, the cost involves suffering, all right? Let's read Philemon, or is that Philippians, sorry, Philippians 1, 7. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Oh. Sorry, no, that was that Philippians must... 129. Sorry, that was my mistake. Um, oh, 29. 29, yeah. yes. <laughs> I said, I'm so sorry. That's okay. I said seven just because I was looking there at seven, terrible. 
um, verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. There it is. It is given to you. Um, I think it was Spurgeon that said this. He said, it is a gift. It is a gift of God to each and every one of us. All right. So don't take it as a punishment from God. No, no, no. It, he wants us to become that, um, how should I say, that treasure. You know, a diamond in the rough really isn't worth too much. It's when it's all honed and cleaned and polished. And that's what a lifetime of walking to Jesus is. It's to bring out that diamond nature in us that he gave to us when he when we accepted Christ, but he wants to get everything off that would hinder that diamond from the full value that, that it is, all right? So he says, it is given to you in behalf of Christ, all right? Not just to believe, and too many of us just think that's all there is. Believe in Jesus, that's finished. Then I get to go to heaven. Now I can continue my life. No, 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 that's only the first step. But it's going to take suffering. Yeah, because of this world that belongs to the devil. The minute you accept Christ, you're going to find there's a lot of problems that come our way. All right. Uh, so let's go to B, 1B, Paul, a chosen vessel of the Lord. This is Acts 9, 15 and 16. Acts 9. 15 and 16. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Yeah, it's a privilege. Uh, now, I'll tell you, in the natural, suffering doesn't, see, and I'm not talking about being sick in your body when I talk about suffering. Uh, please, Jesus died to eliminate sickness. So that is not suffering for Jesus when you are sick in your body. Please don't even think of it that way. This is talking about persecution for the sake of the name of Jesus. Because of accepting Jesus, the suffering that you get in retaliation. All right. Here, Paul had been persecuting Christians. So when God spoke to Ananias to go and pray for him to be uh, baptized in water and to be filled with the Holy Ghost, Ananias said, do you know what he's done? Well, of course, God already knew he had met uh, Saul on the way and had given him a brand new spirit. He had revealed himself to him and um, Saul had repented and accepted Jesus, but he said, he's a chosen vessel to me. And I still have to show him what the terrible thing, great things that he's going to have to suffer for my name's sake. Friends, it doesn't make things look good. I don't like to suffer. I don't know about you in the natural, but we've got to start realizing we're in the realm of the spirit, all right? And whatever God allows, it is for our eternal welfare, all right? He is working on us. He is molding us. He is shaping us, all right? Um, let's go here. I will show him. Yeah. I want you to put another one. Philippians 3. All right. Um, we already, did we do, or yeah, we did 7 and 8. Let's start again there at, with 7, 8, and read down through 11. This is 3, 10, and 11. All right, Philippians. 3. Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings 
being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Yeah, please notice how Paul, he keeps talking about, you know, winning Christ. And here he talks about, uh, if I might attain to the resurrection of, it's not of the dead, out from among the dead, a special resurrection. You know, Paul recognizes, remember he was caught to heaven. He was shown many things, all right? And, and he says, there's a high calling of God. And I want to get that. I don't want to just make it into heaven by the skin of my teeth. I don't want to just barely get into heaven. I want the highest calling there is. I want to be the bride of Christ. I want to, all right, make that, attain to that, a resurrection that is from among the dead. Others don't get to go, but a group is caught. He's talking about the rapture. And that is his, he's, his goal is that. I don't want anything less than the best. Whatever God has the best for me, that's what I want. And I don't care what the cost is. I'm willing to pay it in order to have what the Lord wants for me. All right. Um, would you read for us seven, eight, nine, and 10? All right. As, as a whole. Okay. But what things, so Philippians 3, starting from verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but for loss, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Yeah, and let, be let's stop for a moment. That I may win Christ. You don't win him in salvation. You receive him as a sinner and he changes you. But once you are in Christ and part of Christ, and now we have that race and the God the Father is preparing a bride for his son. And if you want to know how to be that bride, you join that class on Song of Solomon, because that's what that whole book is about. Preparing a person when they first come to Christ as a babe in Christ until she is developed into the bride of Christ by those eight chapters. So you come and that's what he's talking about here. He says, nothing is as important to me as laying hold of him and at the end of my life not only did i find him in the beginning and he revealed himself to me but i become the bride all right of christ i win him all right nine verse nine and be found in him not having mine own righteousness but which is of which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. Yeah. So what he's saying is sometimes, you know, people start off and they recognize it's by faith. And then after they accept Christ, they start thinking it's their good works. No, it isn't. From beginning to end, he says here in verse nine, I want to be found in, in him at the very end of my life, not having my own righteousness, because that's works. That's earning. And no, no, no. He said, it's not that. He says, but the righteousness that comes by keeping my eyes and my faith in Jesus and what he does and what he has for me, it's the righteousness that God gives me. So it's not enough to be given the righteousness. We must hang on to it and live our life that way to the very end, all right? Then he says in 10 and 11, all right, that I may know him. You don't know Jesus when you first accept him. As you walk with him, he will open your eyes. As you allow him to take away things in your life that's hindering you, you get to know him more and more, all right? Not only to know him, but the 
power of his resurrection. We all want that. We all want to know the power. But he says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. He realized there's more than just accepting Christ and getting what I can get from him. If I'm going to be part of him, I've got to walk with him. I've got to identify with him. If people see Jesus in me and they hate Jesus, they're going to hate me. So I want to know, I want a fellowship. I want to have a share in his sufferings being made conformable. That means uh, being poured into the mold to conform, all right, to his death, not just death, his death. What was his death? Saying no to self and yes to his father. I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of my father, which is in heaven. All right. He says, if by any means I might attain. See, it's not something everybody's going up in the rapture. No, 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 not everybody's going up. If by any means, I don't care what it costs me, I want to go up in that rapture that's going to take place. All right. It's from among the dead. It's a special group that will be caught up before all the tribulation and all the things that take place when God comes back. In fact, we'll come back with him as his bride. All right. So let's look at another portion under this Philippians 3, 10 and 11, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Yeah. So if, if you went back earlier, all right, he something came on him, a thorn, and we're not here to discuss it. Nobody can say what it is, but it was something in his body that like a thorn and you know uh, when I studied up on it um, they said it's not like a thorn on a rose a, a little prick no 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 it's like a stake a stake that like stakes down a tent it, it, it was something terrible all right in it was a thorn in his flesh all right and three times he cried out to God Take it away from me. Take it away from me. But this is what God responded. So sometimes God says no to our prayers. But, you know, this was because he had had so many uh, abundances of revelations. So unless you and I have had that many revelations of the future life, don't use this as an answer well god didn't answer me so i guess he doesn't want no 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 don't even put yourself in that category at least i'm not going to put myself there all right uh i will keep unless god and here god spoke to him and said no i you know my grace is sufficient if god tells you that then you quit asking him do you understand what i'm saying if he doesn't tell you that you keep asking till you get your answer. Amen. All right. So it, it was to keep spiritual pride from coming in. Even Paul, as a human being, was capable of becoming too proud. And God said, no, I'll just allow this here. All right. And it was caused by Satan in his life. And it gave him a lot of trouble. And it caused people to look down on him and want to shun him, and so forth. But he says, once God told him that, then he began to, he said, in other words, I'll give you the grace to go through it, all right? Then he says, I therefore 
I take pleasure, and he named infirmities, weaknesses, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses, if they are for Christ's sake. I'm going to take pleasure in it. I'm not going to complain to God. I'm not going to find fault with God. I'm not going to grumble to God. Why? Why? Don't you love me? What's the matter with you? As most of us tend to do. No. Recognize, all right, when we're weak, then that makes us strong because we cry out to the Lord and say, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I can't do it myself but you can help me do it. So recognize when God allows troubles, trials, even persecutions to come our way, all right? He is forming us to be like him. Uh, I, I was gonna write that down, but I, I forgot where it is now. So we'll just move on here. Number two, suffering persecution is to be expected in our life. The cost involves suffering. 2 Timothy 3, verse 11, put 11 and 12, all right. Yes, 2 Timothy 3, verse 11 and 12. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yeah. If, if you dare to underline your Bible, shall suffer persecution. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, it's a definite thing, somewhere down the line, you're going to get it in one way or another. I realize there are some people that suffer a lot more than others, but I included 11 to show you with Christ, uh, with Paul, all right? Persecutions, afflictions, all right, uh, that came from all these places that he was in. But the Lord delivered him. The Lord kept him alive. The Lord helped him in it all. And then he says, I'm not the only one. If you're gonna live godly, you're going to suffer persecution, all right? Now, let's go. Um, I want to give you another one in between uh, the, before you get to John 15, put Acts 14, 21 and 22. Acts 14. Verse 21 and 22. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystria and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Yeah. So when we... When we receive Jesus, we become a part of the kingdom of God. We are now children of the day, children of the light, kingdom of the light. But if we're going to make it from here up there where we actually embody, enter to the kingdom of God, it says it's going to be through much tribulation. I, I wanted that verse 11 because it said, after they had preached uh, and taught many, they returned to these three places, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, confirming the souls. Don't just take for granted when you lead somebody to the Lord, they automatically are going to stick it out. I looked up that word confirm. It means to reestablish and strengthen to reestablish and strengthen, to confirm, to make sure they really were going on with the Lord, not just starting, because it's sad. Some people start, and then somewhere they turn and go away from one reason or another. It isn't always persecution. Sometimes it's the allurement of money. Sometimes it's the allurement of 
uh, things and, and they just get their eyes off the Lord. All right. And then it says exhort. And that word exhort means to implore. All right. Uh, to entreat. He says, confirming the souls and exhorting them, continue in the faith. Don't just start, continue. We need to exhort people. We need to um, implore. It's almost like begging, praying them. Oh, don't just start. Continue in faith. You've begun well. Now continue in faith. And then he let them know. We must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. It won't be easy, but it's well worth it. You know, just like Moses at the very end, you know, kept his eyes on the Lord because he considered, you know, the sufferings of God's children that they weren't to be compared. How, wait, no. The riches of this world were not to be compared to the sufferings because he considered the very end of it all. One is for eternity. So I suffer a bit here compared to eternal suffering. No, no, no. I would rather suffer a bit now, but eternally be one with Christ up there. Whereas if I take care of myself here and try to avoid suffering here and, and you know, even sell off what I have because I don't want to suffer here, then in the end, I'm going to suffer forever. It's not worth it. We've got to keep our eyes on eternity and compare temporary with eternal values, then only we can make proper choices. Let's look at John 15, not just 20. Let's read 18 to 20. Okay. John 15, verse 18 to 20. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were all, if you were off the world, the world would love his own. But because Ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Yeah. So I'm glad I added 18 and 19. All right. Um, 19, especially. Uh, if you are of the world, he's taken us out of the world. We don't belong to this world anymore. We're not part of the kingdom of darkness anymore. All right. He says, I've chosen you out of this world. And that's why the world is going to hate you. We've got to understand the spiritual context of it. It has nothing to do with, I mean, what have I done to them? Why are they treating me like that? What have they done to you? What have you done to them? You haven't done anything. But the devil in them hates the Jesus in you. I told about that time that the lady that came up to be prayed for, and as she walked by me, she looked at me and her eyes said, I hate you, I hate you. I, and I thought, my land, I don't even know you, lady. Why are you looking at me with such hatred coming out of your eyes? Later, I met her, and she was yielding to the devil and going her own way, all right, which she did. She finally left her husband, left her children, and went off to a life of uh, lesbianism, all right, even though God was trying to win her. It was that spirit in her hated the Jesus in me, all right, so don't try to understand it naturally. Well, why does my teacher treat me like this in school? She doesn't treat anybody else. Well, maybe your life convicts her, see, or him, or whoever it might be. Don't try to understand it naturally. There's a spiritual reason. If we're one with Christ, 
whatever Christ received, we're going to receive. All right. If they hate him, they're going to hate us. If they persecute him, they're going to persecute us as well. Uh, let's do that last. Well, it's uh, it's going to be more than just two verses. Acts 5. Forty and forty-one. Acts five, verse forty and forty-one. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. The reason I put this verse was for 41. They counted it worthy to suffer for the shame for his name. All right. They didn't. Oh, poor me. It's really a hard life believing in Jesus. You know, I was beaten. I was put in prison. No, no, none of that attitude. They found it a privilege. They rejoiced to think they were worthy to suffer shame. That meant they were living for Christ. Their belief in Christ was showing itself in its life. Now, I want us to go back to the background of these two verses to him. You don't even know what that means to him. We're going to go back up to verse 17. And... Um, I'm just going to talk about this, all right? They, they were arrested, all right? These same ones, they were arrested for doing, um, many people brought the sick people to them. They were performing miracles in the name of Jesus. And in verse 17, the high priest and those that were with him, and they were Sadducees not Pharisees. We're not going to go into that right now. All right. They were filled with indignation. It made them wild instead of happy. All right. And they laid their hands on the apostles and the Bible tells us they put them in the common prison. This is the background of what we read here. They had already been thrown into prison. All right. And lo and behold, in verse 19, the angel of the Lord came at nighttime and opened the prison doors and brought them forth and literally told them in verse 20, uh, go in the temple it, when it, in the daytime, all right, said, go stand and speak in the temple the words of this life. After they had been thrown into prison for it, the angel of the Lord sets them free and commands them, go and do it again. All right. So um, when they heard what the angel told them in the early morning, they went and they began to teach. Now, the high priest and the council with him that had had them thrown into prison ordered them to go to get them out. And when they came back, they said they're not there. They're gone. In fact, they're in the temple preaching the name of Jesus. All right. And um, it, it, it says that actually they were so angry, all right, that they were ready to want to kill them, all right? Um, and so they told people to bring them, all right, without violence, you bring them. And when they brought them, they said, didn't we command you not to teach in this name? This is 28. And you filled Jerusalem with his blood and with his um, doctrine and so forth. Verse 29, Peter and the other apostles answered, we ought to obey God rather than man. I mean, they were very bold. They had already been in prison, but they had had an encounter with the Lord. The angel had come and told them, and they were very bold. They said, no, we're not going to obey you. When it comes, when you tell us to do something that is totally against God and what God told us, then we have to obey God. If, if God didn't tell us no, then we will listen to you. But God told us to do this. 
You're telling us not to. You make a choice between the two. And, and I'm telling you for whatever it is, whether it's religious authority, governmental authority, whatever it is, as long as it doesn't go against what God says, we're told to submit to those that are over us. But if it's against what God tells us, you listen to God. He's the highest. All right. Even if it means. Uh, all right. Now, in 34. Actually, when I told you they sought to take counsel, that was they put them out for a while. And in verse 33, they were ready to kill them, to slay them. And they 34, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. All right, a doctor of the law. He's the one that um, Paul, when he was Saul, used to sit at his feet and learn under him. They all respected this man very much. And he told them, you better be careful because if this is God, you're gonna be fighting against God. If it's not of God, it will fall by the wayside. And that's why we started with 40. To him, they agreed. And so they called them and then they beat them and let them go because really they had no reason. They were doing good. They were healing people and so forth. All right. So, um, well, we've kind of gone over five minutes. That's all right. We'll uh, take our 10 minute break. Then we'll come back and do our second page. All right second part to this counting the cost 10:15 yes 10:15 Okay, start on our second half of this lesson. I don't think we need to um, do our review since it was just 10 minutes ago that we finished, all right? So we're on counting the cost and um, capital C, the third main point, the cost involves suffering, which on the page part one, we did three points, all right? Um, and here, we're gonna start with point number four, suffering as a Christian, all right? Let's go to First Peter chapter four, verses 12 to six. 16, yeah. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. <clears throat> if ye be reproached by, for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God on his, on this behalf. Well, th this really tells us clearly. All right. Um, as a Christian, we don't want to suffer because we've done wrong, but rather if we suffer because of Christ for Christ's sake. All right. And he tells us in that verse 12, uh, 
the fiery trial that is to try you. So uh, sometimes the persecutions aren't exactly uh, that easy to take, all right? And they're not just a, a, a small little thing. They might be really bad, but don't think it's strange as a Christian, if you're suffering for the sake of Christ, then realize that we need to rejoice, that we're counted worthy. We need to rejoice because there's another verse that tells us if you suffer with him, you will also reign with him. If you suffer with him now, you'll reign with him in the future. If you're not willing to identify with him in sufferings here, if you don't want to accept the persecutions here, then you won't be counted worthy to reign with him on high. So it says, pray that you might be accounted worthy. Uh, remember, we talked about that in one of the, uh, the lessons uh, to escape all these things. And one of the ways to be counted worthy, we don't go and invite it. We don't purposely do things to bring it on us. But if we have to, for the sake of Christ, it says here, all right, um, the spirit of God, that's verse 14. If you're reproached, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. It's because we identify with him that we're actually going through this suffering. It shows that we're really one with him. It shows that it really stirs up the devil and makes the devil mad, but that's good because we really, he's being glorified in our lives, all right? Um, so you have your ABC under that. If we suffer as a Christian, all right, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God. In other words, begin to thank God, praise God, Lord, that you found me worthy to suffer for you. And let him not be afraid or troubled. That's 1 Peter 3, 14. 1 Peter 3, verse 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Yes. Don't be afraid and don't be troubled. All right. Uh, if you go to the one right before, it says, who is he that will harm you if you're followers of that which is good? So in other words, <laughs> I, I've known people, they're, they're arrested because they did wrong. All right. And then later they tell people, oh, I suffered for the name of Christ. No, you never. You suffered because of what you did was wrong. It was your own sin. It was your own. Don't, don't try to put that on to the Lord. But if really we suffer because we're one with him and um, the anger of the devil stirs up whoever it is to get us, all right, we, we can be thankful for that. All right. And don't be afraid and don't be troubled because that just opens the door for the devil to attack us even more through the fear. It gives him the upper hand in our life. All right, let's go to number five, suffering for righteousness sake. Matthew five, this is of course, while Jesus was still here on this earth before he went up. Um, 10, yes. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So it, it says that if we're persecuted for righteousness sake, it's counted a blessing. It's God's, it shows that we're one with him. It, if Jesus was persecuted, what makes you think that we're not going to get persecuted as well? You know, we have this idea that 
if we accept Christ, then everything goes smoothly. No, there's nowhere that we should think that everything uh, just, you know, you'll have no problems, no problems. If it's for righteousness sake, when you face people that hate uh, righteousness, they're out for the, the bad and they don't want the good, you're, you're going to suffer as a result of it because it's light and darkness at war with each other. All right. So it says we're blessed when men <clears throat> revile us. That means that's verbal reviling, downing, <clears throat> persecuting. All right. Saying all manner of evil. We are to rejoice. Amen. For great is our reward in heaven. We don't always get the reward down here. We don't, we're not always understood down here, but we will get it up in heaven. And that is the eternal reward. That is the lasting. That is God saying he's pleased with us. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. All right. Um, okay, let's go to Roman numeral two arming ourselves this means we've got to prepare our mindset if ahead of time you know and then in your daily prayers when you pray for the, to the lord just say that lord help me lord that to see it the way you see it to understand it the way you understand it and and not to see it as just a mere human being all right our mind is very important. Our actions are based on our thinking, all right? So if you feel it's shameful to suffer for Christ, then you're not going to be willing to suffer for him. So that's why I'm saying you need to understand. Sometimes we don't understand everything. Uh, there is. Um, verse of scripture that I don't have down here, but I, I think I'll try to find it here. Um, Psalms 66. Yes, Psalm 6, um, verse 10. Would you read that for us? Psalm 66, starting with verse 10. 10. Okay. For thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net, and thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. Okay, that, that's it. All right. Here, the psalmist is saying, you've proved us. You've put us to the test. All right. Like silver. Silver is tested with fire. All right. And it will melt it. And any dross, any dirt in it will rise to the top when it's melted. All right. So it says, Lord, that's how you tested us. You're the one that allowed us to be brought into the net. We were trapped, it seemed like. All right. And you uh, put affliction on us. All right. You allowed people to ride over our heads in the natural. Who likes that? For somebody just to run over you and ride over you and put you down and they seemingly get the upper hand, all right? Uh, but it says, even though we went through fire and water, it doesn't matter whether it feels like we're being burnt alive or whether we're being drowned, all right? But the end result is what happens. You brought us in a wealthy place. You brought us into an enlarged place. You brought us into a place where we became more like you. And isn't that what counts? To the natural man, 
it's not worth it. And we get angry and then we talk bad and we find fault with God. No, but when we understand it spiritually, that God is perfecting us, God is working the Christ life in us, through us and out of us till we will become in our daily walk of life to be like Jesus, where people will see us as they see Jesus. That, that is a marvelous thing, all right, to become more like him. So it says here, if we have reservations in our mind, we're going to hold back and we won't be able to obey everything that God wants. But number two, Christ's obedience and commitment to the Father brought him great suffering. I want you to put there Isaiah 5, 5 to 7. Isaiah 50, verse 5 to 7. <clears throat> the Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. All right, now this is uh, an, the example of Jesus. And of course, this portion in Isaiah is a prophecy about Jesus. But when Jesus came to this earth and he began to read the Old Testament books, you know, the Holy Spirit led him to read these. He knew what was going to happen to him. He read it and the Holy Spirit let him understand. This is talking about you. All right. And it says the Lord hath opened mine ear. In other words, I could hear what he wanted. In fact, I'm going to read to you uh, verse four. Um the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. So th this is about Jesus. God dealt with him, spoke to him, all right, and taught him from day to day. Every day, God would open his ear, tell him what was going to happen that day and what to do that day and how to respond and so forth. So here in verse five, he hath opened my ear. I know what he's wanting me to do. And even after he told me what he wanted me to do, he didn't just say, I want you to die. He went into detail. All right. He said, I was not rebellious when God told me what was going to happen to me. And I didn't turn away from it. I didn't walk away from God. I knew what it was going to cost me. And I did it in verse six. I gave my back to the smiters. That was uh, the cat of nine tails. All right. Psalms refers to it. The plowers plowed upon my back. You know, when they plowed, they had a wheel. And they pushed this wheel and it would go through the dirt and, and it had things on that wheel. It would take and make a groove in the dirt and throw here and throw there and make this groove. So when it talked, that's the plow, how a plow does in the earth. Well, the plowers plowed on my back. This cat of nine tails was a whip that had nine different whips coming out and in them were embedded you know hooks and bones and metal all right and when they would go like that and then pull it at, those hooks would latch into the back the flesh and literally rip the flesh off all right and it, he says here i gave my back to the smiters 
And then God showed him they're going to take the, you know, when you get old like me, you know, I have to take tweezers and pluck the whiskers. They start coming out as a woman. You don't want whiskers. So it doesn't really hurt. But, you know, if a man's beard, you, you, you don't just take one and go like that. They would mm, and just I mean, it ripped the face. It ripped the face. And so it says my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. And shame and spitting. The words of shame, the mockery, uh, the reviling that came. But spitting, twee, twee, right in the face, you know. And you, you, can't, you can't defend yourself. You can't even wipe it off. And people spit being splattered on your face and on your body. We don't know what Jesus went through. He went through hell on earth. It was not only physical suffering, it was spiritual suffering. When God literally, when he became sin for us, God turned his back on him because God cannot look at sin. And that was the first time since the womb that Jesus or the son of God had ever known the father not to be one with him. When he totally identified with your sin and my sin, then God turned his back on him and left him alone in the darkness of sin, all right? To be, and he had to go down into the depth of the earth, into the pit, all right? And, and it, it was terrible, all right? But he says, the Lord God will help me. In other words, he's reading it and knowing this is what's going to happen to him. He says, therefore, when he says confounded, it means ashamed. I'm not going to be ashamed. Let them spit at me. Let them say what they want. Let them slap me. Let them do whatever they want. Um, I'm not going to be ashamed. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint. You know, flint is one of the hardest rocks there is. A flint. And when you say you set your it's like, I will not given i know what i'm going to go through and i'm prepared because he's going to help me i'm depending on him to give me that supernatural strength to be able to go through it all right i, I told you in one of the other classes it's one thing to go through suffering and you have no say in it you know for instance like if you fall into a fire Yes, you scream, you yell, but there's no way you can get out of it. But if you're given the choice ahead of time, if you don't do this, if you do this, if you renounce this, whatever it might be, then you don't have to go through that. Oh, that, that is a totally different thing. You have a choice whether you're going to do it or not. And this is what we have to understand. And like Jesus, where he said he set his face like a flint, then you and I need to understand, yes, as a Christian, I don't only get all the good things from him. On this earth, until he conquers this earth and takes it back for himself, the devil is here, the God of this earth and the God of this world. and he hates Jesus, and I've got to be prepared to suffer for him, not for my sins, but for his name's sake. I must be prepared. I need to set my, I need to mentally be prepared for it. So when it, the time comes, I won't turn around and, you know, turn against the Lord. All right. So. Christ, his commitment to the Father brought him great suffering, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical. It even brought him death. So our minds must be armed. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. 
first Peter four, verse one and two. <clears throat> for as much then as Christ hath suffereth for us in the flesh, arm you, yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffereth in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Yeah. Now, when, again, I want to say this suffered in the flesh. It's not talking about when you're sick. All right. That you've ceased from sin. You can be ever so sick. That doesn't make you stop sinning. All right. This is saying when you suffer in the flesh by denying yourself. That's the way Jesus did. He denied himself. He was determined with the help of God. I will do the will of God. I will not please myself. So it says we need to arm our thinking in the same way. No matter what it costs me, I want to choose, I must choose to do God's will, even if it's saying no to self, even if it means I have to suffer, because ultimately in the end, if I'm not willing to take that cross and deny myself, I'm not going to make it. That's all there is to it. I'll end up choosing to please self and that is going to lead me on a road to eternal damnation all right so it says here when we have suffered in the flesh by denying self by saying no to the flesh life you've ceased from sin because that's what sin is by pleasing self i don't care how little it is uh, let me quote you this verse from Isaiah 55, uh, no, 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 53, verse 5, I think it is. It's either 5 or 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. All right? We've all gotten lost. We went the wrong way. We have turned everyone to his own way. There it is. What is sin? Sin is going your own way. Sin is doing your own thing. Sin is pleasing yourself. So when you arm your mind to say, I'm willing, I want God help me and pray, God, give me the strength to take up my cross and say no to the self. And you, friends, I need, this is what I tell myself. If you can't say no to little things God asks of you, do you really think you're going to be able to say no when you're asked to give your life, when they're going to cut your head off and so forth? No, you've got to be willing to say no to the little things. And as you say no to the little things, when the big thing comes, you'll be able to say no. You'll be able to say no. So practice it in your daily walk of life that when God convicts you, when God tells you, don't do this, learn to say yes, help me, Lord, I won't do that. I won't say that. I won't behave like that. I won't think that. I won't look at that, whatever it might be, but he is telling you, all right, if you will start in the little things when he talks to you uh, to listen to him, then you will find that you will be able, because it says in verse two, that you no longer should live the rest of your time to the lusts of men, to the desires of mankind, which is yourself and anybody else, all right? But you're just going to live to the will of God. Okay, Christ was armed in his mind. He suffered for us in the flesh. Let's put there First Peter 2. 20 and 21. First Peter 2, verse 20 and 21. For what glory is it, if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto, were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Okay, 
So he suffered for us in the flesh, all right? He was willing to die in obedience to his father. And he left us an example that we need to be willing, even if need be, to die, all right? It, ultimate, really, death, you know, for to do the will of God. But as I said, we need to practice and learn to die in little things. Then when the big item is called for, we will find that we won't be quick to run, all right? Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, all right? Suffering in the flesh, not sickness, but rather denying the self. That's the person who has ceased from sin because pleasing self, that is what sin is all about, all right? Uh, number three, be prepared to suffer for Christ. If obedience demands suffering, all right, if obedience requires hardship, put there 1 Peter 5, 10, and after that put 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 10, and 11. 1 Peter 5, verse 10. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that he, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Yeah. Amen. So God called us to his eternal glory. All right. And there it's letting us know there is going to be suffering after you've suffered a while. That means all the time you're here on this earth. All right. May the same God that called you through this, he will make you perfect. He will establish you. That will uh, get you to sink your roots down. He'll strengthen you. He'll settle you. Amen. Let, let's see that 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 10 and 11. 4, 10, 10 and 11. 11. <clears throat> Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in your body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Go ahead and read verse 12, even though I don't have it there. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. So constantly the Lord is working the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is his dying? saying no to self. That was what it was, denying self. And that's being worked in us constantly, every day of our life, to learn to say no to self, all right, to deny the self so that the life of Jesus might be seen. The two cannot go hand in hand. You cannot be pleasing self and still letting the life of Jesus shine out of your life. No, there is no such a thing. You, If Jesus is going to shine out of us, it, it's going to take saying no to self, no to self. And it's going on. So it says, we which live are de always delivered. At all times, we're being delivered unto death, to a place where we have to say no to self. Every time you turn around, little things, big things in your home, in the store, wherever it is, all right? We're being tempted all the time just to live our own life, behave the way we know to behave. No, if we belong to Jesus, everything we come across is going to be demanding of us. God will allow this to come up. You have to make a choice. Do you choose self or do you choose God? Do you choose your own self, or do you choose the life of Jesus in you? Which do you want to be exemplified in your life? And when you keep choosing to say no to self, yes, death is working in us, but 
the other people are going to receive life, the life of Jesus that is going to benefit them and help them. So um, if obedience requires hardship, determined to do his will, remember what it said up there in Isaiah 50. He set his face like a flint. Set your face. I don't care what it costs, but don't do it in your own strength because it's not going to work. So daily, Lord, strengthen me, especially if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let, let me just tell you, before the apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit, all of them, of course, Judas had already gone over to the other side. But when they came to take Jesus, Peter stuck around for a while. He cut the ear of the high priest's servant off. But then when it, that was before they had actually latched onto Jesus, once they took Jesus and bound him, you go read it. They all ran away. They ran away. And Jesus had told them ahead of time. And Peter had said, no, 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 no. I'll never, others might forsake you, but I'll never forsake you. But they did. They all ran away. But when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, after that, most of the apostles died martyrs death, horrid death. All right. Thrown into boiling oil or had their heads chopped off, being crucified upside down. That was Peter. D different thing. They, they died horrific deaths. How come before they would run away from suffering, but now it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not just talking about praying in tongues. I'm talking about you really receive the Holy Spirit. You pray in the Spirit. You learn to walk in the Spirit. You learn to yield to the Spirit. If the time comes that you have to really suffer for the Lord, he will be there to undergird. He will be there to give you that strength and power. So I beg of you, if there's any of you, there's, uh, I don't, I think it's 590 something I'm seeing there. But if there's any of you that have not yet been baptized with, the Holy Ghost, all right, I pray that you are going to start saying, Lord, you save me to baptize me, all right, and when John the Baptist, I remember because I just read it recently, John the Baptist said, you know, I baptize you in water, but there cometh one after me, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. You have to receive him first. And then after you, you receive him as your savior. After you receive him as your savior, then you ask him to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And when he baptizes you with the Holy Ghost and with the fire, of the Holy Ghost, they're going to start a purifying process in your life. And that's what this suffering is all about. All right. Let's do our last point, point four. Choose to suffer for Christ. This is Hebrews chapter 11. Yes. Hebrews. <laughs> 11, 25, and 26. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Yeah, this is talking about um, Moses. I tried to uh, refer to this. I didn't do a very good job. So good. It's coming up. But it says it's by faith that Moses did it. It was not by his own efforts. It was by faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by God speaking the rhema into our life. So as we learn day by day, 
when God speaks to us to by faith obey him. All right. That same faith, Moses was able to choose to suffer affliction with the people of God. He received the ability to be able to do that. He made a choice rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin because that's only seasonal, that's only temporary, all right. And the reason is verse 26, he esteemed, this is the way he saw it, eternal, no, the reproach of Christ, all right, which was temporary, was gave greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, whoa. Egypt was rich in silver, gold, uh, many other things, all right, because he saw the eternal reward. Suffering a bit here and giving up the treasures here, it's well worth it because I'm going to have eternal reward of joy, happiness, ruling, reigning with Christ, rejoicing with Christ forever and ever. It's better to suffer a bit here and then eternally rule and reign with Christ. So consider uh, the reward, all right? Whether it's temporal or eternal. More he considered the reproach of Christ more valuable, all right, than the treasures here on earth he looked to the ultimate end he looked to the reward so are we willing to suffer for christ number one i want to say we need to be baptized in the spirit because in ourself it, it doesn't mean the disciples were um you know cowards traitors no 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 in themselves they didn't have that kind of ability but after receiving the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enabled them, gave them that type of fortitude, that type of ability to carry on. And not only the apostles of old, but many people throughout this life have been martyrs for the Lord, have suffered greatly for the Lord, have gone through much persecution trouble and trial, and you wonder how they could do it. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Um, do you remember what our next lesson is? I think it's victory, isn't it? Lesson yes. 12. Yes. Victory. Lesson 12. Learning yeah. to trust the Lord. Learning to trust the Lord. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, Spirit of the living God, we know all this up in our head, but many times we have not had to go through it. And yet I remember when we came to Singapore in those days. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't that easy for people to accept Christ. And I knew quite a few people that suffered greatly. They were beaten. They were tied to trees and beaten by their brothers. Some were kicked out of the home, not allowed back in again. But Lord, you kept them true. You kept them faithful. Thank you, Jesus. You can do the same for us today as we look to you. May we not just hear the verses, quote the verses, read the verses, but Lord, make these verses a reality in our life. And may we realize in ourself there's no way. So we need to be filled and refilled regularly 
by your Holy Spirit, allowing you to quicken us, enable us, enrich us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I pray for each and every one of these 500 plus that have been listening to today's lesson. Oh, Lord, may we receive it from your spirit to be willing to suffer for Christ. And right now, I want to lay my life on the altar. And as many as are listening, if you want to do the same, let's say, Jesus, I lay my life on the altar. I don't know what it really means, except I don't want to keep following the self life, listening to myself, obeying myself, pleasing myself, protecting myself. Today, I want to say, Lord, I realize I don't belong to myself. And today, I want to lay myself on that altar of sacrifice. I give myself to you. I am not my own. I am bought with a price. Therefore, I want to glorify you in my body and in my spirit, man that you might be glorified, that you might be lifted up, whatever the cost, give me the strength and the power to go through it, that you might be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.